this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com as we are taking a look ahead at Week 10 of college football, breaking down the biggest games on the board this weekend and what Ed's numbers say you should be betting. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Ed Fang. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. You can find Ed on Twitter at ThePowerRankEd. Uh, we're talking college football today, but... There's also Game 7 of the World Series tonight. I have been frustrated with this series because it's been going super late and I'm old. Uh, so I'm, I'm young, excited man. there's a Game 7, but I can't talk about. I can't do this anymore. Uh, so uh, <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> uh, I'm doing good. It's been a busy week. Um, I'm, I'm excited there's a Game 7. I don't know if I'm going to make it till the end. Aren't they starting it at 7.30 Eastern a little bit earlier than... I'm pulling These it up right games? now. Uh, or maybe that was the, the start. It's of 808. The so like, it's not like the uh, they had like with the NBA Finals. Those games that started like 840 or something, and it was just ridiculous. Uh, and I'm interested to see how this goes because Max Scherzer's had like back and neck issues in the past, and my level of trust that he is like fully healthy is not that right. large. Uh, right. So I want to see how he does, but like from a betting perspective, it kind of terrifies me because I don't have a good read on his health. Yeah, well, I mean, it's been such a. I, I completely agree with you, and I've I have no idea about what his health is like. I mean, he was warming up last night. Yeah. So it seems like he could be good to go. Uh, I think it's been a fascinating series just because the road team has won every yeah. single game, and that seems like very unlikely. Yeah. And if you just look at the market odds, it was about one in ninety-four chance that that happens. Wow. But that's really not that rare because if you just flipped a coin on each game, it'd be about one in 64 chance that the road team would win every game. So, um, yeah, I thought that was just some stuff I did this morning. Um, you know, my numbers like Houston about 56 percent to win tonight. Uh, you know, it's 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 been it's been kind of a fortunate series with my numbers that it, it they've been lower than Houston at home. Yeah. Uh, than the markets, which is which has obviously been good. Um, and, uh, but I think it pretty much agrees with the markets tonight. So it's, uh, you know, I, I think baseball, any sport gets pretty exciting as I was telling my eight year old when right. it's just one game and, uh, winner take all. So it, it's going to be exciting. I really want, uh, I don't remember what year it was, but the year where Madison Bumgarner came out of the bullpen yep. and went like four or five innings on like a couple days rest. Yeah. I want to see Garrett Cole in Madison Bumgarner mode. No, nothing against Zach Ranky. Zach Ranky, he's a really, he seems like a good dude. Like, he seems like uh, he's very thoughtful and stuff like that. Like, I, I, I yes. like him, but I want to watch Garrett Cole in a short burst, personally. Like, that'd be unreal. Yeah, yeah I think I think that would be fun. Um, I remember Bumgarner after that game. He was just, <laughs> he was just like, someone was asking him, are you tired? He's like... <laughs> No, nah, dude, I just won the World Series. What are you talking about? <laughs> He's one of the weirder baseball players. And there are a lot of weird baseball players, <laughs> specifically pitchers. They're very strange as, like, human beings. But he's up there. He once dated someone named Madison Bumgarner, uh, according to – I think it was Vin Scully who told that story. Um, <laughs> and, like, you're surprised to hear that, but then you know it's Madison, or Madison Bumgarner. You're like, okay, if I were to pick one baseball player who would do that, it would be Madison Bumgarner. So right. it winds up being not that surprising. So hopefully we get Garrett Cole in there tonight at some point. We can get a good Garrett Cole story. Maybe he's dated someone named Garrett Cole. I don't know. Uh, maybe we'll learn this. But it should be a fun to have a Game 7 either way. Halloween tomorrow. So pretty fun couple of days here on the docket. Also some fun today, Ed, because we're going to go through what your numbers say right now through the first nine weeks of college football. We're going to discuss your adjusted success rate model and what it says about a few teams entering this weekend. We're also going to go through what your numbers say about this week's biggest games because we haven't really done a deep dive into your numbers 
And so we're going to dive into that in a little bit. Uh, And as a reminder, we have our NFL podcast coming up on Thursday as well, Halloween. We're going to talk with Dr. Eric Eager of Pro Football Focus again to get his thoughts on the NFL for week number nine. To get that podcast right as it is posted, make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. You can find that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Store, or anywhere else. And while you're there, please leave a rating and review as well. Before we get to Ed's numbers and what they say about week 10, though, we're going to take a look back at week number nine. We had Ryan the Crystal of Number Fire and Bleacher Report on to preview week nine. We're going to go through what happened there and also a NASCAR bet that I regretted a couple of hours later. More on that in just a second. Covering the past. All right, let's take a look back here at week number nine of college football and see what Ryan McChrystal had. He had LSU minus 10.5 against Auburn, and LSU struggled a bit here, uh, but they actually, I think, played better than the final score indicates. Uh, They won by just three there, uh, so Auburn did cover. Also talked about Iowa State minus 10.5 against Oklahoma State, but Oklahoma State won that game outright, and Brock Purdy, still my guy, didn't have his best game, (laughs) though. Uh, Still, I will not abandon the the Brock Purdy truther train, but he didn't have his best game there. Uh, we talked about Penn State minus six and a half and the under for that game, and Ryan did get both of those. Penn State won by 21, under hit by a touchdown. So uh, that both of those bets did hit there. Ed, you talked about Ohio uh, State actually, versus Wisconsin. Jim, so we should also just mention real quick on that Penn State-Michigan State game. A lot of rain. Yeah. That certainly helped the under. Yeah. Uh, and then... Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, it, it was raining throughout the Midwest uh, last Saturday. It was yep. coming down really hard in Ann Arbor during the first half of the the, the Michigan Notre Dame game, and you saw a lot of running. I don't think that was necessarily the plan, uh, yeah. but it led up at halftime, and things really opened up in that game. So um, yeah, but anyways, the the weather was certainly a factor in some of these games. And it did benefit Ryan there. So that certainly helped uh, in that one. You had uh, the over on Ohio State versus Wisconsin at 50 and a half, and the Buckeyes upheld their end of the bargain. They put up 38. Wisconsin did not. Uh, Ohio State hasn't allowed more than 10 points since their opening game. I think it was FAU put 21 up on them. Um, So Wisconsin just couldn't get anything going. But let's talk about Ohio State's defense. Um, we're going to talk about your adjusted success rate model, your, your numbers in a second, but what are they saying about the Ohio State defense right now after another impressive game? Yeah, I mean, absolutely a top 10 unit. First of all, I just got to say, this is probably my worst call of the year. <laughs> um, the market moved, I don't know, maybe three or four points to the under on this one, which is a little bit embarrassing. I think some of that has to do with the weather, but I think the Michigan-Notre Dame total moved like two points. So there was certainly yeah. some market movement against me. Um, I kind of knew the way this would go wrong is if both of the defenses played that well and, and, and they did at least, I mean, they both did in the first half right? and, and Ohio state, uh, did in the second half as well. I obviously clearly haven't watched enough chase young videos this year cause, cause he was pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, it was not my, not my best day on the show. We both gotten bit by the exact same thing in back-to-back weeks. I had the over in the Northwestern game, too. So, <laughs> or no, I had the under uh, in that one. That didn't work out either because Chase Young was so good, he gave them short right. fields. So Chase Young, an animal, uh, and someone who is giving us some problems here. But I want to talk to you about that Michigan game, too, uh, because sure. I didn't get to watch the game. I pulled mm-hmm. up the box score, saw the final score, and... Right. My face melted, basically. <laughs> what happened there? Like, how did how did that happen? Yeah, you know, it was interesting. Um, I actually just, I, I, I usually review the games before I go on the radio on Thursday. And I got through the first half and, you know, kind of, I've kind of forgot. I, I kind of assumed that Michigan just had to run the ball yeah. because of the rain. That's actually not the case. They actually tried, they came out and tried to throw it a little bit. Yeah. Didn't necessarily work out. And then the running game just started to work. Uh, there was an eight-play drive with nothing but running plays. And that's just certainly something I did not expect with what we've seen from Michigan's run offense versus a Notre Dame defense that is is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, so so Michigan went out and thrashed them. It was particularly the run mm-hmm. game. Uh, pass game definitely chipped in in the second half when the rain let up. Um, but just, you know, that's the Michigan team I think everyone expected at the beginning of the season. We finally saw them. Uh, and I'll also say, like, the, the defensive line is just not the same unit as it was at the beginning of the year. Uh, they, are, they are playing strong, physical, something, I mean, w- we simply did not see in the first three games of the season. Right. And I think that it's encouraging to see Michigan do this, and they've now had 
a couple of decent, I would say. Uh, I mean, the Notre Dame one was the best all year, but they've had a couple right. of decent performances offensively recently. Yeah. Do you think that they have turned a corner, or is this simply variance where they've had a couple of good games that happen to be kind of near each other? Yeah, I mean, so you look at this, and, and the first three games were just terrible, capped off by the Wisconsin game. Nothing went right. Um, uh, did well against Rutgers, and the last three games have been really good. I mean, I think they played excellent against Penn State. Yeah, um, as well, good Penn, as they Penn did. State defense is really good. Yeah, Penn State defense is really good. I think they, I, I mean they played excellent minus you know the drop balls and. Um, you know, you just can't spot a good team. I mean, maybe a great team like Penn State, 21 points at home, and, and think you're going to pull it out, which they almost did, right? I mean, they almost, they almost tied it at the end. So, And I think it's one of these situations, you know, you're always trying to figure out whether it's the first three games that reflects on the team or the, these last couple of games. And just given, you know, preseason expectations, I, I, I think it's more the latter. Right. Um, this is kind of how we expected them to play. And, you know, I mean, the, the road gets kind of relatively easier for the next three games until they hit that Ohio State game. Yeah. Uh, no one's really expecting them to be they're, they're not going to be the favorite in that game. But I think the sentiment has gone from they have no chance in that game to, well, right. Maybe there's a chance. And the other thing, too, is they're learning essentially a new offense. And it makes sense that there would be some growing pains in transitioning right. to a different offense. And maybe we're seeing gains within that now. So yeah. hopefully that's what that bodes, but it's, it would be under, I think that the early season struggles are understandable, I guess is what I'm saying. A, a little bit. I mean, but LSU's kind of having a new offense too, that's right? True. I mean, they have, they have the same OC, but I mean, a lot of new concepts right. that, uh, that, that one of the new coaches brought in. So it's kind of an excuse, but you know, that's true. I think that's a very valid point. Uh, also, last week here on the show, I talked about Brad Keselowski to win at Martinsville. His number was 7-1, to one, and we talked about that on Wednesday. Friday was practice. I didn't get to watch practice. Pulled up my phone, looked at the 5-10 and 10 lap averages. He wasn't good, and I was like, uh-oh, we've made a mistake. So he actually did close at, uh, he closed at 10-1. to one. So I lost uh, some pretty serious closing line value there, and he started off 15th. Kind of, you know, whatever, worked his way into the top 10. I was like, all right, whatever, at least this will look less bad. Then he got to third, and he was running behind William Byron and Martin Truex Jr., and William Byron's never won a NASCAR race. So I was, like, praying that William Byron would just dive bomb into the corner and wreck Truex and open up the door for Keselowski, who was in third. Didn't happen, but it at least felt less embarrassing to bet a guy at 7-1 who finished third than to bet a guy who never had a chance. I don't think he ever had a chance realistically, so I never felt good about this bet after we discussed it. Uh, but, you know, it, it wound up being fine. Um, I don't know if it was entirely the correct process play there because he's not in the playoffs anymore. He, they changed his pit crew. Uh, they swapped it with his teammate, Ryan Blaney. He may not be getting the team's most elite equipment now that he's not in the playoffs. So it wound up being not that embarrassing, but I still don't think it was entirely the correct process play there. So right. uh, practice time showed me right away that I had made a mistake. I wish I could have taken it back at that time. We could not, <laughs> uh, but oh well. That's the weird thing about, about NASCAR is that you have practice times and you can decide if you want to bet before practice or after. And I think with Keselowski going forward, I want to wait until after practice because he doesn't tend to put up that great of speed in general. Uh, so it's a weird dynamic with NASCAR is knowing when to bet different guys. Like, if you ever want to bet Ryan Blaney or Kyle Larson, do it before practice, because they're always fast in practice. Eric Jones, kind of a similar thing. But Keselowski might be one of the guys where, if you want to bet him, I'd probably hold off. So, mm -hmm. that is our look back at last week. We'll dive into Week 10 in just one second. But first, if you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, or Indiana. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's move now into Week 10 of college football and break down Ed's numbers and what they say about this weekend. Covering the present. All right, as mentioned, no guests for today here on Covering the Spread. We're going to dive deep on Ed's numbers because, Ed, we have this awesome resource here, a.k.a. you, and we don't always get to utilize it because it's fun to talk to other people, get their perspectives on college football, but 
I'm okay with taking a step back for today and focusing on your numbers. You can find all these over at thepowerrank.com. Uh, the adjusted success rate numbers for members over at the Power Rank. And for people who don't know what those are, what all goes into formulating those numbers? Yeah, so so Jim, first I appreciate you uh, acknowledging my ego and let me just talk through uh, covering the present. <laughs> Always appreciate that. Always like to hear myself talk. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about success rate. So at its very simplest, uh, success on a play is 50% of the necessary yards on first down, 70% on second down, and all the yards on third and fourth down. And Bill Connolly over at ESPN has done a lot of the seminal research on that. And he just found that success rate is uh, very predictive. So if you look at the success rate at this point in the season, it's going to predict the success rate uh, going forward. Uh, I've looked into this a little bit. I've certainly found that to be true. Success rate is very predictive um, and more so than, than yards per play. Yards per play tends to be a little bit more correlated to the number of points that you score. Um, but there's there just happens to be a lot of randomness in that statistic. And you can, it's pretty easy to to figure out why, you know, if you get a, if you get a pass play that goes, that gets tipped off of a defender and falls into your receiver's hands and goes for 80 yards, that can have an outsized effect on your yards per play. Uh, it doesn't for success rate. And that's one of the reasons why it's more stable. And, you know, teams that have a good success rate, it's just, it's about staying ahead of the chains, right? It's, it's about not, you know, not picking up a penalty and mo mo moving yourself back, like staying on schedule, keeping those drives going. And it just turns out that that is what is uh, is very predictive going forward in college football. The other part, too, I think, is that anecdotally, like the numbers bearing this out is not surprising because anecdotally it makes sense that this would be the case. Because if you are consistently putting your team in second and 10 and third and 10 scenarios, right. that's not sustainable. Like the Eagles, right. the, the year they won the Super Bowl, they had this crazy success rate on third and longs. I don't know how they did it, but like they did. Right. And... That was good for them. It right. meant that they had some good schemes, but it's not necessarily sustainable. And that's yeah. why I focus a lot on success rates, even for fantasy stuff. Because mm -hmm. when you see a guy uh, like Todd Gurley, his rookie year, had this awesome yards per carry number. His expected points added per carry was very good. But his success rate was criminally low. And basically, it meant that he was feasting off of big plays. And in his second year with right. Jeff Fisher, uh, that was Jared Goff's rookie year, he regressed in a big way. So I think understanding and utilizing success rates is something that can apply just more broadly to better gaming uh, you know, decisions, whether it yeah. be fantasy or, or betting. And I think that that's why I have a lot of faith in the numbers that you put out is because I know that the process behind them is very sound. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you certainly see like these these third down success rates in, in college football, too. Like Cincinnati's offense, not, you know, an offense that really scares you by any right. stretch of the imagination. But I think they were like 55 percent in converting third and long last year with a freshman quarterback. Right. Um, so, so you see a lot of fluky stuff like that. Um, success rate kind of, uh, you know, that you, you clearly need some big plays to make that happen. So anyways, uh, success rate helps you look um at, at what is really predictive. And I should also mention, you know, uh, with explosive plays, there there tends to be more randomness in explosive plays. So this is also work that Bill Connolly has done. And he looked at, you know, how explosive were your successful plays. And he found that that regressed the mean uh, early to late season very strongly. Right. And so, you know, if you're a team that's feasting on big plays, if you're a player like Todd Gurley that's feasting on big plays, you tend to see regression. Right. And uh, we'll we'll talk about that throughout this show. Right. So let's move into talking about them further. And obviously you're adjusting for opponent, adjusting for a lot of things within right. the success rates. How does that factor into your model when you're trying to bet an individual game? Yeah. So, um, so I've been working on this all season. Uh, my intern's been working on it. And finally, that was ready this week. So Monday morning I sat down. I was like, all right, I'm putting this in my model. And you have to decide, well, how much are you going to weight it? Right. And the only good thing to do is to look back at the previous six weeks and see how it's done, to see how it is done compared to other elements of my model, um, such as, you know, market data, yards per play. Um, you know, success rate turns out to be one of the strongest predictors I have. So it has a pretty strong weight in my model now. Um, and, 
yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's something that is going to be good for, for finding value uh, heading down in the future. So when you know that it's had success in the past, does that make you more confident in your numbers when going forward, knowing that, that this thing has done relatively well and it's now more prominently featured within the model? Yeah, for sure. I mean, just looking how how it's done, I think gives you a sense. Because otherwise, I have no idea what way to assign it. Right. Um. You know, one of the things I did over this past off season was to be very careful about exactly what weight I assigned to various parts of my model. Um. And you know, yards per play ended up getting a smaller weight than I initially expected. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, kind of the only way to maybe properly and, and it's not like I have it right completely by any stretch. I'll probably fiddle with it as we get more data from this season, but. Uh, it, it deserves some pretty good weight, and, and we'll talk about how that affects some games this week. Absolutely. And we'll dive into those games in a second, but I want to pick your brain a little bit more because I'm selfish sure. and would like to learn more about this personally. This is mostly for myself, uh, but we've got some perceptions, I think, around each team by this point in the year because we are nine games in or ten games in for some teams, and we've got perceptions around each unit and each team. So when you look at your numbers, are there any specific units, whether it be offensive, defensive, etc., that stand out uh, with numbers that may be surprising to me slash the public? Yeah, I mean, one one unit that stood out to me immediately as soon as I looked at this last week was Iowa State. So this is, uh, we talked about Brock Purdy. Uh, the offense has been great, and the success numbers support that. Uh, but the defense has looked really good by adjusted yards per play as well. They've been sitting around the 9 to 12 area. Um, actually, right now they're 12th in terms of adjusted yards per, per play. Uh, they're significantly worse at success rate. So they're 48th when you look at success rate adjusted for strength of schedule. So what does this mean? Well, probably that, you know, they've been really good at um, preventing big plays in the sense as much as you can, in the sense that they're, you know, big plays and these explosive plays tend to be kind of random. So they've either gotten lucky or they're good, depending on your perspective on that. And, but when it, comes to getting a stop in a critical situation they're they're probably not the defense that their yards per play numbers suggest they are and there's probably some reasons for this um you know they have a defensive end jaquan bailey who led them in tackles for loss had 14 and a half tackles for loss last year he got hurt in september uh he's decided to redshirt and come back for ne next season and so when you miss one of your most explosive athletes on defense uh that's certainly going to help um but you know it, it's and you know, they clearly had some issues uh, against Oklahoma State. Um, that d wasn't really a success rate thing. That ended up, you know, Oklahoma State uh, had a bunch of big plays that really pushed up their yards per, per play uh, in that game. But it's something I am looking forward, uh, you know, going forward. Like, just how good is the Iowa State defense? And can they, you know, can they be good enough to, 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 to knock off in Oklahoma? Well, I think that was the surprising thing for me with that game, too, was... I have this perception of Iowa State as being a really good defense. And then watching that game, Chuba Hubbard had like this parting of the Red Sea type moments uh, at one point during that game, had this huge long run. And I think there was like a screen to Tylen Wallace at one point that he broke off for a long touchdown. And it was surprising for me to see that because I had this perception that Iowa State is a really good defense. And those were big plays. They probably were surprising from a success rate perspective or from a yards per play perspective too. So when you see a split between yards per play and success rate, you're going to skew more towards the success rate number, correct? Yeah, and, and just you expect the yards per play rank and rating to fall, mm -hmm. uh, or I guess rise um, when we're looking at defense. Right. Um, so I, I, I think part of the way to look at this is if you could play 100 games, yards per play and success rate would pretty much agree yeah. uh, with you know, you're, how how efficient you are either scoring points or preventing points from being scored. Unfortunately, like, we don't have that luxury in football. Right. And I think what we, what we found, and again, Bill Connolly has done a lot of this work, is, is success rate gets the answer quicker. Right. And we're constantly dealing with small sample sizes. Uh, I think, like, success rate will be less susceptible to one play, obviously, than uh, right. yards per play will be. So I think there's a lot of value in that. So... Uh, definitely excited to have these numbers on our side here. So let's dive into a couple of games here for week number 10, starting off with a cocktail party. I don't know if I'm still, can still call it that. Uh, regardless, Georgia <laughs> against Florida. Georgia is a four and a half point favorite. The total here is 48. And Georgia, I like Jake Fromm, and I like the, some of the talent they have on their offense, but 
they're they're really frustrating. I kind of hate them. Um, <laughs> I, they've been really frustrating at times this year because there's no explosion. But as we know, explosion isn't necessarily predictive of future explosion, if that's the way we right. phrase that. But what do your numbers say about this Georgia team offensively? Yeah, I mean, offensively first, you got to remember uh, the South Carolina game was very fluky. A lot of turnovers in that game. Georgia had significantly more yards than South Carolina in that game. But so I, I don't, you know, I think offensive wise, they were good in that game. They weren't so much against Kentucky, but now we're talking about one game. Right. Uh, success rate wise, like they look pretty good. They're they're sixth on offense. Um, and, and you kind of have to believe in Jake Fromm and DeAndre Swift. I think one of the criticisms is that they've been a little bit conservative. Uh, they've run on 57% of their plays this year. But, you know, I mean, they, they've been pretty good running the ball with, with Swift. Um, they're fourth in the nation at, in, in my adjusted success rate. So, so there are some reasons for them to, to be doing that. So, yes, I think you can have some faith in, in the Georgia offense. I don't, I don't think, like, the last two weeks have been really indicative of, of what that offense is. And, and the talent um, is still there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We talked with Bob Stoll last week about the value of air yards, and I think that's my biggest frustration with Georgia is they don't air it out. Uh, like, right. when they do throw, like, okay, so going to the NFL, I wish they were more like Detroit, where, like, if you're a little bit rush-heavy, you know, that's okay, as long as you're chucking it deep when you do throw. And Detroit has done that this year. Minnesota, you know, the Vikings have done that recently. Georgia doesn't really, I don't know if it's Jake Fromm not chucking it deep or if it's like the offensive scheme and it's designed to be more dink and dunk, but I wish they'd open up a little bit more. Uh, but right. the success rate numbers to me are not that surprising. I think it makes sense that they would do well there. We should expect them to grade out better going forward. So what does that make you think about this line here? It's Georgia minus four and a half. Do you have a lean one way or another there? Yeah, I mean, I, I was very excited about this at minus four and a half. Uh, my number said... Uh, Georgia should win by almost seven points. Okay. Uh, I believe the markets have moved since then. I think I think they're up at six and a half now, uh, which suggests uh, not any more value in this game. Um, you know, Florida's been pretty solid, even behind uh, Kyle Trask. Uh, they're eighth in passing success rate, which is pretty good when you have your your backup quarterback in there for for the last four games. Um, Dan Mullen's done a really good job with the quarterback position. Um, you know, I mean, I think the, the my numbers do lean towards the over. Uh, my numbers yeah. have uh, the total at about 56. Okay. Um, I'm, I don't know if I love that, and, and I love it less because the market seems to be moving the other way on that. Yeah. But that's certainly that, – that's the lean by, by my numbers. If the total has gone down uh, three and a half right. and the spread has moved two points, like that's a pretty significant move against them. Is it so, six and a half at, at FanDuel? Yeah, six and a half right now. Yeah, I think um, that's a fair – I think that's a fair – spread but you want the over on 44 and a half no not really <laughs> okay <laughs> understandable i think this will be an interesting game i think that i was down in florida initially when felipe franks went down but as you said kyle trask has done well uh so yeah. should be a fun game i want the georgia offense to do something different but i always try not to assume coaches will change because the longer track record says coaches do not change. Uh, so I'm not right. expecting that. I'm hoping for it. Let's move here to Utah at Washington right now. Uh, this number is Utah minus three and a half. The total 47 and a half. That has gone up a point uh, since yesterday. It was 46 and a half. We've talked about Utah a couple of times on the podcast. I know we did a, a week. I think it was week zero or week one. Uh, where does their defense rank nationally for you right now? Because anecdotally, they seem to be one of the better units in the entire nation. Yeah, absolutely. And the numbers definitely back that up. I mean, they're fifth when I look at adjusted success rate. It's one of these situations where that exactly agrees with adjusted yards per play, uh, where they were also fifth. And, you know, really, this is kind of a golden opportunity for, for Utah. I mean, they clearly look like the best team in the Pac-12 South. Uh, they lost that game to USC. Um, but, but I'm you know, numbers-wise, they are the best team in the Pac-12 um, they've been pretty good on offense, too, uh, ranking 11th by adjusted success rate, which I think is a little bit more of a surprise yeah. for that team. And as a team, you know, when I do my member rankings that give the predictions, they're they're up to 10th. They're actually ahead of Oregon right now. And 
I think for Pac-12 fans to have two teams that, that could be in playoff contention has got to be pretty exciting at this point. Well, especially given the way the year started, where you had Utah get off to this good start, but the USC game was their fourth game of the year. And that can kill optimism pretty quickly, uh, right. but they've done well, really well since then. I think that, you know, we talked about this, oh, was it Edward Egros we talked about Utah with, uh, where that USC loss was kind of like going to slant perception of them for a while. I think we've kind of seen that. Uh, they've right. consistently covered since then. And I think that if you want to make a statement as a team for the committee, this is kind of like their last chance to do it because they have UCLA, they have at Arizona and then versus Colorado. This is probably the best game left in the schedule. So could be one of those statement games where Utah wants to show that the strength they've got here. Yeah, it's certainly a statement game. I mean, they're going to have the Pac-12 championship. If everything goes their way, they're going to have a Pac-12 championship yep. game against probably a one-loss Oregon team mm -hmm. that I guess would be like, would be undefeated through through the Pac-12. So they'll have their chances. They'll have their chances to in impress the committee. Um, and but but let's you know let's not think that they're just going to go up into Washington and beat Chris Peterson's program. Right. You know I have Utah as a favorite, uh, about three point six points as a favorite. So um, which pretty much agrees with the line. Doesn't yeah. suggest any value on the side. Jim, you picked all games where it's not much value on the side. <laughs> it was intentional. Um, yeah, <laughs> but but just to go into the success rate a little bit more, you know, Washington has had such a good defense uh, in their time as as a national program, top ten type program under Chris Peterson, and it looks like it's struggling a little bit this year uh, by just the success rate. They're fifty seventh, and that's something that's significantly worse than their twenty six by yards per play. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, is, any thoughts on the total here? Forty seven and a half. Uh, yeah, I mean, leaning a little bit towards the over. Uh, my model says forty eight point eight. Okay, so, so pretty efficient. Not love. Yeah. Yeah. Efficient across the board. Should be a fun game, though. Uh, so I like watching Utah. I like watching good defensive lines. So I think it yeah. should be a fun game to watch. Let's move on here to uh, a really fun game. SMU against Memphis. SMU undefeated, but Memphis now a six-point favorite. That game was four and a half. Total has gone up to 72. So this is going to be a fun game to watch. Uh, we've got SMU undefeated right now, Ed. So they've looked good, obviously. Yeah. Once you adjust for their schedule, how do they grade out based on your numbers? Yeah, so last week um, I pulled up, you know, I have computer code and scripts that that generate my predictions every week. And the first thing I see on the Thursday night game is SMU by 1.4 points over Houston on the road. And quick check, the markets were at 10. They eventually got to 12 and a half. I'm like, oh, this is this is just such a poor way. You know, when a member logs into the site, that's the first thing they see is something that's off by eight points to the market. <laughs> Not good. Um, it turned out to be OK. Um, yeah. You know, SMU won the game. I think they won by three. Yep. But it certainly wasn't uh, a definitive type game. You know, I think when you look at they're undefeated, but when you look at SMU, the reason the numbers don't like them as much is those games against Tulsa and last week against Houston. So in both those games, the opponent had more yards. In both those games, the opponent had a better success rate. Tulsa took them all the way to overtime. SMU was able to get the win. Um, and then they obviously had to squeak it out last week uh, as well. So, you know, there's a couple of different ways to kind of break this down. You know, like in the preseason rankings, SMU was 77th. When you look at just data from this year, so looking at, uh, both my team rankings, which is margin of victory, adjusted for schedule, and then success rate, yards per play, um, they're 39th. Okay. So they are performing well, but maybe not as well as people expect, given their their a no record. Um, so you know, I make this game Memphis by 4.3 points, which actually suggests some value on SMU in this game now that it's up to six. Yeah. Um, so. I, I kind of don't really know what to, to to make of the SMU team. You know, it's yeah. they're kind of in this limbo land where they're outperforming expectations, and we should probably believe that, but maybe tempered a little bit. I mean, your numbers were right last week, so maybe maybe we don't need to. Um, but how much is the prior still baked into your numbers right now? Because we are deep into the year, but there's still a ton of variance in what's happened in 2019. So it makes sense to still have the prior in there. Uh, how much yeah. of a factor is that at this point in the year? Well, it's a tough thing to answer directly. Right. So, like, the explicit preseason prior is still in there. Right. Uh, it's very small. Yeah. I also use uh, market data 
to evaluate these teams. And that's a very interesting combination of what we thought at the beginning of the season, because I'm still including what the market thought back then right. and how things have evolved um, later in the season. So it's hard to say exactly how much of the prior is in there, but it's certainly in there. Uh, you do have to evaluate it. And, you know, when I'm when I'm kind of looking at these games, you know, I, I, I kind of split it up into three different predictions, right? So what the preseason prior was, which which, like I said, is a pretty small right now, what we get from this season's data, which is big, um, and then what we get from the markets, which is a, a pretty powerful predictor. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, you can kind of make your judgment about which one applies the most. Um, and and it's just a tool that I use to, to help find games. Yeah. So we've seen this, this number move. Uh, it's Memphis minus six. How far would that number need to move for you to have confidence in SMU? Because it, it could still move further. Is there a yeah. spot where you think that you'd actually be willing to pull the trigger on SMU? Yeah, I mean, I'd have to go back and look at injuries, but but I yeah. think like six, six and a half, like I would okay. definitely lean towards that. Um, just just based on what the numbers are saying. Okay. Uh, any other bets that stand out to you as being advantageous on the board for Week Ten at FanDuel Sportsbook? Yeah, there's one I really like, Jim, but I'm I'm gonna save that for covering the future. Oh, good tease, man! You can tell you do radio, man. <laughs> <laughs> Ed's a pro here. I like it. We're going to get into covering the future in just one second, but anything else you want to add in about your model before we uh, close up shop for this segment? Yeah, absolutely. There's one thing I wanted to say, because I was, uh, you know, we came into the season wondering about Oklahoma's defense. Yeah. Uh, it's just a unit that was kind of atrocious last year. Came into the season, lost their best player in the secondary to start. Um, the offense has been rolling, but what exactly were we supposed to think of this, this defense? Well, they're actually 18th in the nation uh, in adjusted success rate. Oh. So I thought that was pretty high. Uh, but, you know, that is supposed to be the number that's supposed to project better going forward. Um, they're a little bit worse by adjusted yards per play, uh, 28th. But 28th is an excellent number compared to, to where they were yet last year. Right. So the numbers suggest, and you know, I know they lost to Kansas State last week, but the numbers suggest this is, this is a stronger Oklahoma team than even last year. And uh, we will see... You know how they, you know whether they can make the playoff and and what kind of competition they can give to the top teams in the country. I'm guessing that Oklahoma or that that Kansas State game will probably have a stink on them for a bit, because right. your defensive numbers are fairly high on them. I guess like higher than we would expect, especially based right. on the Kansas State game, given that it was a high profile loss. Do you think that would present a buying window for Oklahoma? Obviously, it depends on the number. Uh, so it very much depends on the number, but is that a spot where you would be looking to potentially buy into them down the road? Buy into Oklahoma? Yeah. Uh, potentially. I mean, yeah. it was a fluky game, right? Like I'm, I'm looking at it. They had Oklahoma 9.4 yards per play. Yeah. Kansas State had 5.8. It's kind of hard to lose a game <laughs> when you're that much more efficient than your opponent. Right. Now that that takes, you know. It, it doesn't happen often. Right. I, I should hopefully tell you, but I, but I, but I can't. But right. <laughs> like how often that actually happens. But it, it's got to be pretty rare. So yeah, a little fluky. Um, you know, as far as the playoff picture is concerned, I don't think it really hurts them too much. I mean, no. you have zero margin for error. I guess going in the future, you need to win your conference championship game. Uh, it would help if you won out and you know don't trip up against an Iowa State. Um, but. But yeah, we'll see. I, I, I don't know what the market is going to say about Oklahoma, but yeah. definitely something that I will be watching. And they have a, a really good schedule going ahead. So they're going to have chances to prove themselves. Uh, so I would agree that they're not done from a playoff perspective yet. And it'll be fun to see what they can do. They get uh, It's kind of like a covering the spread bowl against Iowa State, I would say. Uh, and then Baylor is the week after that. So that's going to be a fun one, too, that we will definitely yeah. discuss on the podcast. Uh, so that'll wrap up covering the present. We're going to take a quick second, and we'll come back and take a, finally get into what Ed wants for covering the future as well. Covering the future. All right, before we dive into that number that Ed likes, week number 10, Ed and I always preach searching for the best value in betting on games and look no further than the new odds comparison our engineers have developed over at numberfire.com. Oddsfire is a premier odds comparison experience across major bookmakers in the regulated U.S. market. Compare odds, quickly identify the best value, and even identify examine first-party FanDuel data all in one place. Never settle, always get the best odds. Check out the experience for free, now on NumberFire or at OddsFire.com. Gambling problem? Call 
Gambler. All right, Ed, I got to let you uh, put your radio experience to good use here. You teased it brilliantly. So what number do you like here for Week 10 in college football? Yeah, so I'm going to stay in the Big 12, and uh, I really like Kansas State plus 6.5. And And the story is kind of all about success rate and how it very much favors Kansas State. So just for example, you know, the 33rd in adjusted success rate on offense, significantly better than the 77th they are in in adjusted yards per play. And it just means that, you know, this, this team is much better at staying ahead of schedule than they are at big, breaking big plays. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're successful, you'll eventually get those big plays and uh, expect that unit to be better. And then the same thing on defense. They're 22nd in adjusted success rate on defense, much better than the 72nd uh, that they rank in adjusted yards per play. So Kansas State is one of those teams that gets a significant bump you know, in my system when 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 I add in the success rate. Now, it's kind of the opposite for Kansas. Uh, um, so when you look at their rush offense, this is kind of comical. They're 21st when uh, in adjusted yards per carry, but 80th in success rate. Whew. And so that means you're, you're a boom and bust type of running game. Uh, they have a pretty talented star in Puka Williams that's the running back there. Uh, was much more efficient last year in terms of yards per carry, but it seems like this year he's either you know going for a big play um, or you know getting stuffed. So you know Kansas has been better on offense, and in looking into this game, it was really interesting to look at the story of uh, quarterback Carter Stanley. So he's been with the program two years. They played three different quarterbacks last year, one of which was Stanley, and he was pretty good. He played in the Oklahoma state game completed 75% of his passes, six yards per pass attempt. Uh, but the coaching staff decided to bench him the, the next game anyways, after a couple passes. So, and they weren't good on offense last year. So, you know, the guy stuck it out. He's there. That coaching staff is not Les miles has come in. Les miles is not exactly known as a quarterback whisper. Right. Um, but you know, the Kansas, you know, the pat the, the pass offense has, has been pretty decent. So, and then Kansas on defense, you know, they, they, they look like the ultimate bend but don't break type defense. Uh, they're 117th by success rate, uh, but a, res- a better 70th by adjusted yards per play. So maybe they're playing to the talents of their defense. You know, the numbers really like Kansas State uh, at minus six and a half. What did I say? Plus six and a half. I keep making that mistake. No, it's, <laughs> Kansas State notice. minus six and a half. I really want plus six and a half, but I know I'm not going to get that. Uh, hey, look at and, odds fire. See if you can get plus six and a half somewhere else. You never know. <laughs> but I've said it multiple times today. Like, you can the show, so like, no, Kansas State minus six and a half. It is wrong in my notes. Uh, and 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 it's the kind of game that that I'm interested to watch. And you know, if Kansas is going to win this game, or if they're going to cover they need to kind of break big plays, right? Yeah. They need to kind of live above and beyond what their success rate numbers say. And and if, if Kansas State can kind of keep it, um, can kind of prevent those big plays and perhaps break off one of their own, um, they should they should be able to to cover in this game. And, you know, I mean, just, just program-wise, like, right. yes, Kansas has improved, but they're still not, um, you know, they're still on the bottom end of Power 5 teams. Right. Uh, Kansas State has been a lot better this year. I think it makes sense just from a program perspective as well. So it's convergence of one team on offense that is due for positive regression and one team on defense that is due for negative regression meshing up here, which is interesting given that you would think Kansas State would be overvalued by the markets coming off a big win. But right. if the you know yards per play numbers aren't saying that they should be, you know, heavy favorites. It makes sense then that the markets would lean this way. So Kansas yeah. State minus six and a half lean here. I think it's I like having these numbers. We can know which teams are due for regression going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's an interesting perspective for Kansas as well, right? Because mm-hmm. they they get the win against Texas Tech um, last week. They they pushed Texas to the brink, which is seems like a pretty good result. I mean, we've talked a lot about how bad Texas' secondary is. Yeah. Um, and then. Uh, they had a game against Oklahoma where they were in the game for a they half. They were in the game the whole first half, yeah. Yeah. It was weird. Um, it was weird. I mean, look, I think this program is better. Right. I, I mean, I think Les Miles has them in the right direction. Right. I think it's a long road until they're a respectable football program. Um, but even with all those things considered, I, I think you got to like decide on Kansas State in this one. The other thing, too, is that Oklahoma game, them keeping it close may be tainting the way people view about them, too, because – 
you know, they did keep it close the whole game, but the final score was still 45 to 20. And Ken Pomeroy has always talked about how two halves of data is better than one. Uh, <laughs> so the final score, probably more indicative there. So I think, uh, I think that makes a lot of sense to go with Kansas State minus six and a half. For my cover in the future, I want to talk about Baylor. And I've been interested in their numbers pretty much all year, and I kind of want to hear what your numbers say about them too. But I like them minus 18 at home against West Virginia. It's a big number, uh, but I'm not sure it's big enough because Baylor ranks 12th. Uh, if you go to the power rank and check out the public-facing rankings, Baylor is 12th there, West Virginia is 77th, and West Virginia as a whole is actually worse than Northwestern based on your numbers, uh, partly because Northwestern's defense is good, uh, but that's not a good indicator if you're worse than Northwestern because they're terrible. Uh, if you look at number fires numbers to kind of back that up, uh, Baylor is 14th, West Virginia is 77th there, so on the same page as the power rank. And part of this is that Baylor should put up points against West Virginia's defense. I kind of like Charlie Brewer this year, uh, but it's also, I just think that West Virginia is going to have trouble scoring points here. Quarterback Austin Kendall got banged up in their game against Iowa State. He did play against Oklahoma, wasn't particularly good there. He averaged just 5.9 yards per attempt. And they have had a bye week to get him healthy. But even for the full season, before that injury, his adjusted yards per attempt is 6.0, which is not good. Uh, Charlie Brewer is at 10.1 on the other side. Uh, it's a big improvement from where he was last year at 7.7 and 7.9 the year before. So I think that the quarterback advantage is major in favor of Baylor here. Number fire projects West Virginia to score just 14 points here. That would mean that Baylor would need to score 32 points to cover minus 18. I think that Given how good Brewer has been and how bad this West Virginia, Virginia defense is, I think they should get to that, uh, especially when you look at what Baylor has done against better defenses. If you look at FanDuel Sportsbook right now, 84% of the money is on Baylor. So I would say that it's wise to grab this number before it gets any wider. It opened at 17 and a half. It's still 17 and a half at some books. So probably okay to do some price shopping there. Uh, but I think Baylor minus 18 is advantageous here, Ed. Uh, but what do your numbers say about Baylor? Because other places are pretty into them. Is adjusted success rate also in on this Baylor team? Yeah, I mean, I think all my numbers are are in on this Baylor team. I mean, they've moved up significantly. They're actually 15th uh, in my, in my, mem in my member rankings that, that I do my member predictions on. And that's, that's higher than they were this preseason. Uh, you pointed to all the reasons the offense has been, has been really good and West Virginia, you know, has dropped and you know, they, they obviously weren't going to be the same team without Will Greer, but, um, you know, new coaching staff, a lot of issues going on there. Like I mentioned before, like, you know, I break things down as a preseason component, market component, and then database on this year. The database on this year certainly likes Baylor. Uh, yeah. 20, they like him to win by 24 points in this game. That needs to be blended in with the other stuff, which put, puts it pretty close yeah. to you know what the market has. But you know if you believe that this year's data means the most for these teams, and I think you can definitely make that argument, yeah. um, then that suggests that taking taking the points with Baylor. Okay, so Baylor minus 18 and Kansas State minus 6.5, the two bets here on covering the future for this week. That's going to wrap up today's show. But once again, we're back tomorrow with Dr. Eric Eager of Pro Football Focus to get you set for week 9 of the NFL. We talked with Eric about college football last time, getting some NFL takes out there this time. Subscribe to Covering the Spread to make sure you get that. And while you're there, please leave a rating and review as well. Those will help us out a ton. Thank you to those of you who have left ratings over the past couple of weeks. Uh, those are very very, very helpful. So thank you to those of you who have done so already. Ed, uh, we know you have your email newsletter going out tomorrow. Uh, where can people get that? Yeah, I'm at the thepowerrank.com. Uh, that is my site for better football predictions through data and analytics. And then I had Kevin Cole of yeah. Pro Football Focus on the podcast this week. Uh, Kevin is uh, a great person to talk to because he tends to always be right about things. So we had a pretty long conversation about not not long. We had we had a good conversation about the NFL, uh, Aaron Rodgers, whether quarterbacks should always try to minimize their interception rate. Mm -hmm. um, and then some some Bayesian analysis he did on NFL quarterbacks, um, which was pretty cool. He's been doing this for a while, but now he's got access to all the PFF grades. Right. Um, so it, it's just another way of, of looking at that. Kevin's one of those guys who I always make sure to read his tweets uh, because he's a very intelligent person. And he used to write for Numberfire. 
And I was sad because he left us, but it was because he got a full-time job. And I'm like, oh, that's, like, awesome. Like, I like it when good people get jobs. But I'm also yeah. like, oh, man, it was so cool to have him writing for Number Fire. Yeah. So I'll have to check that out. I love Kevin's work. Uh, and those sound like topics he would know a lot about. So I'm, I'm pretty yeah. pumped uh, to check that out. That's the football analytics show to hear what Kevin Kowals And, and Jim, you got to have a lot of time to get through all of Kevin's tweets, too. Oh yeah, <laughs> you put a lot out there, which is great. I can't see. I re- I can't say I read all of it. Like a lot of it shows up in my timeline. Right. But it's like you know, it's like kind of deep too. It's oh like yeah. Sometimes yeah. I just want something entertaining on Twitter. It's like sometimes you get to Kevin's tweets, you're like, all right, maybe later. Sometimes I desperately <laughs> maybe, need maybe something entertaining on Twitter. Later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, I'll be sure to check that out at the Football Analytics Show. You can find all of Ed's numbers that we talked about today by going to the Power Rank and becoming a member there. Also, some public facing stuff as well at the Power Rank. And find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, as always, for producing for today and keeping us on the air from a video perspective. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in for this edition of Covering the Spread, getting you set for week 10 of college football. Good luck with those bets. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to get you set for NFL. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.